All right, all right. Happy Friday, guys. Welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. I do believe my special guest is here, so I'll go ahead and bring her in. My special guest tonight is Jamima Pierre. Uh, she is a contributor at the Black Agenda Report. Uh, welcome, Jamima. Hi, Sabrina. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I've been waiting to bring on uh, someone to discuss this crisis that is happening in Haiti. Uh, so I'm, I'm so happy that you were able to join me. I want to start with this report here from Al Jazeera. They reported that Haiti's prime minister, uh, Ariel Henre, tenders resignation as country descends into chaos. And they went on to say here, uh, that Haiti's prime minister, Ariel Henre, uh, has tendered his resignation and app peeled for calm as the country descends into chaos. So I think a lot of people know by now uh, that Haiti is experiencing uh, a crisis. There have been a number of reports of gangs in Haiti uh, rising up. Uh, there was also a report that gangs in Haiti were participating in uh, cannibalism. But I wanted to hear from you, and I want to start with this issue with Ariel Henry. From what I understand, uh, he actually was not... Uh, installed by the people in Haiti. He was installed or at least propped up by the U.S. government and other foreign powers, from what I understand. And my perception was that the activity that we see right now is basically the people pushing back on the U.S. government and other countries uh, selecting their leaders. Uh, but I want to hear from you, and, and let's start with his installment. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I, I want to say that the whatever crisis is in Haiti, uh, that's in Haiti right now, it's a crisis that began more than 20 years ago, and this is a flare-up. Um, it's a continuous set of flare-ups, and this is just the latest one. Ariel Ali could not resign because he never held a position that was deemed legitimate or <laughs> according to the Haitian constitution or Haitian people. And, and so when people say he resigned, we have to laugh at it because it was just, you know, the U.S. State Department called him while he was on a plane back from a trip that they paid for to send him all the way to Kenya um, and, and told them that, you know, he can't get back into the country. I do think, I don't think the U.S. State Department expected him to not be able to get back to the country. I think their plan fall, fell apart. Um, um, what they had planned before, it fell apart. So I think now they're scrambling to find a particular kind of policy. But, you know, you can't understand, you know, the way that the mainstream media represents Haiti, and I have to start with that, is just horrendous and um, and has been horrendous for 200 years, part specifically because Haiti has this history, right? It is the first and only successful slave revolt in modern history and became this black first black nation in 1804 after 13 years of a war against the, the world's most powerful military, Napoleon. I'm sure you didn't see that in the Napoleon movie, but um, we defeated Napoleon's army. And it was because of that, that the US was able to buy the Louisiana territory and France gave up its ambitions in, on, in the Western hemisphere. And ever since then, you know, Haiti has been paying for that. Um, in fact, they kept trying to reinvade Haiti so much so that Haiti had to pay an indemnity to France in 1825 basically the, the slave, the former slaves paying their masters for, and um, they spent more than a hundred years paying that back. It's a, the equivalent of $30 billion now. Um, and so that they would be left alone. Um, and then U.S. occupied Haiti in 1915 to 1934. You, and Haiti has been under occupation since 2004 when the U.S., France, and Canada back to coup d'etat where the U.S. went in with the Marines took out our president, put him on a plane and flew him to Africa. So if we don't, if, we, if you don't understand this, this story, and so what's, what's happening now, the, the reason there's even a bigger problem is because from 2004, the U.S. did this coup d'etat and because the U.S. and France are key members, right? Permanent members of the UN Security Council were able to call on the UN Security Council to send a, 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 a military mission into Haiti, basically justifying the coup. And then um, they basically have been running Haitian government. Um, they dis, you know, they dismantled the Haitian state. So when they took a president out, we had 7,500 um, uh, mili uh, elected officials. Now we have zero um, because they installed, you know, um, brazenly installed government after government um, in Haiti. Um, and, and I know I'm talking a lot, but I just want to just point out that 
one of the key things is 2011 where Hillary Clinton flew into Haiti after the earthquake and demanded after forcing Haiti pay for these elections and then the, the candidate they want did not make it. They forced the Haitian Electoral Council to change the election results to put in who they wanted. And this is this is the beginning of Ario Ali because he's part of that political party. Then um, that political party that continues to reign, that continues to reign of terror, that armed young people um, to go in um, and 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 massacre the people who are protesting against all these terrible policies and practices of the government. And they would call them gangs too. So I'm very wary about using the word gangs, but I do think it's important to like you know, people present it as if this came out of nowhere. And it's like these black people running around with guns, eating people, you know, and, and that's not new because if you look at a 19, I think July, 1921, New York times headline while Haiti was under occupation, the headline was Haitians eat a U.S. Marine. Right. <laughs> and so, so I, I just, I just have to let y'all know, cause this, this rep reporting on Haiti, and then they use all kinds, if, if you look at the pictures, it's the same like three or four clips that they keep showing over and over again in mainstream news. And I've seen pictures from the earthquake from 2010 represented as if it's happening today. And so I just, you know, it's, and the other thing is Haiti is a country of 13 million people. The, the most of the violence is happening in the capital city where about two and a half million people. So you would think the whole country's up in flames. You know, my family's in the countryside in the middle of the, it's not, it's not that at all. And so it's just, we really have to be careful with the mainstream news. I can't even watch the mainstream news. I mean, I haven't been able to watch them for years. So, but I know the representation of Haitians is just really terrible. I 100% agree. Um, I've I've been noticing this as well. Uh, Dan Cohen came onto the show a while back, and he was debunking some of the stories that mainstream media said about Haiti in reference to the gang uh, activity. Would you refer to what's happening in Haiti right now as more of a form of resistance against uh, Ariel Henry and other Western powers? I think it's a combination, but you know, there's been resistance against Ariel Henry and the U.S. forever. The mainstream media doesn't pick up pick that up. In fact, 2018, 2019, against this particular political party that the U.S. installed in 2010. In 2018, there were millions of young Haitians on the street protesting against the US, France, and Canada for, in, for cons consistently intervening in Haiti's politics, for, for forcing economic policies that people did not want. For, for example, one of the things that Ali did that the other president wasn't able to do was the IMF has been trying to get Haiti to remove fuel subsidies for the people. Mind you, Haiti's an impoverished country. Haiti's not poor. It's impoverished. And I have to make that distinction because everybody wants our minerals and our oil. So that's, you know, so if we were poor, they would not be coming in there. Right. But the point is they remove fuel subsidies and it raised inflation 40 percent overnight. And people were protesting this in the millions. And and what one of the so so two, and then they stole this money. We had this development package from Venezuela under Hugo Chavez. Um, it was called the Petro Caru funds. And that same political party stole three billion dollars of it, right? Um, and so, and these are the people put in place by the US, right? France and Canada. And so people have been protesting nonstop. What's happening now is I think they're protesting, and Ariel Henry, as the powers before him, used to arm these young kids going in to basically terrorize the popular neighborhoods where you have the seat of the protest. And I think what happened is, um, you know, a lot of them, when when the U.S. is pushing for, you know, a, a, a military invasion, which is still pushing for, by the way, supposedly led by Kenya, I think they felt that they felt threatened. And I think for the for the first time, they came together um, and and to to push against this. And and they also felt, I think, a lot of them felt betrayed by Henri, who had been paying them. <laughs> in the past, as well as his political party. And I think they decided to come together and say, well, you know, we need to get rid of him, but we also need to get rid of the 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 the, the international community. So right now, I'm not sure I would call that a revolution just yet. I do think there's a possibility for something to happen because but I but Haitians how are extremely upset at what the US, France, and Canada has done because it's their, you know, and people are like, well, why do you blame others and so on and so forth? Haiti does not produce guns or ammunition. All the guns come through, are, are from the US, coming through private ports owned by the Haitian oligarchy, the non-Black Haitian oligarchy. These are private ports. They're the ones that have been funding and funneling money and arms to these armed, armed groups, them. And so 
what so when people say that you have to think about the fact that the u.s government had the nerve to remove our government i mean this was worse than the maidan in ukraine right it's like they removed our government and imposed uh, you know a whole other apparatus and because we're poor you know we don't have a military so we can't get away with it and then you also have you always have people who who go along with some of these things because for personal benefit but this is you know Henri is is to me is not the main problem. The main problem is the US, France, and Canada. And they're gonna to continue to be the problem because what they wanna do is militarize the entire region because they're afraid of the rising China and Russia influence. Interesting. Why would Kenya, because if it were me and I'm thinking if, if I were in Kenya or if I were Kenyan, why would I choose as as someone part of if you're a part of an African country, why would I choose to go get myself involved in Haiti, knowing what the West has done to Haiti? I don't think they know. I mean, I think that's the difference. I don't think I think one of the things one of the significant things about the, the Haitian situation is that. You know, I say Haiti's under occupation. Haiti's been under occupation for 20 years. One of the significant things about what happened is the U.S. and France, two members of the U.N. Security Council, um, staged a coup d'etat. And everyone who's watching this can go to YouTube, I mean, go to Google and Google Ottawa Initiative on Haiti, because they planned this a year before in Canada, where they decided that they were going to remove this president that they didn't like. And they said they were going to put Haiti under tutelage. Right. And then they carried out the plan. They armed, you know, they like Guy Philippe, the guy whose name is made everywhere. The U.S. trained him in Ecuador. U.S. Special Forces trained him in Ecuador and then funded him and put him in the Dominican Republic and funded a ragtag group of armed paramilitaries. Right. So 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 part of that is when the coup d'etat happened, when the U.S. you know, ambassador to Haiti, the deputy ambassador went to Eric's house, took him. Out. And then the ambassador went to the U, uh, to the Supreme Court judge's house. It's like two, three in the morning, right? And it's like, I'm making you interim president, right? When this happens, immediately, France and the U.S. had already drawn out a document for the U.N. Security Council to actually go ahead and say, this: we need a stabilizing mission in Haiti because it's a it's a danger to international to the international community, which is BS. Haiti is a tiny little place. And so the UN mission was able to give cover to this coup d'etat because people thought they were coming to help Haiti. So the mission, this is the US's new policy. That's why I say Haiti's an in, a, a laboratory, because they're basically saying Haiti's a problem that they caused, but they were able to get a UN peacekeeping control um a force of 12, you know, at 12 million military, that the whole thing, led by Brazil, Lula. Lula's Brazil led the military wing because they promised them a, a seat on the Security Council. Lula led that. And then it's like multinational countries because they think they're participating in the UN mission. But the UN mission is based on a lie and it's based on a coup. So everybody's participating in the occupation of Haiti, right, without really necessarily realizing it. And so they think they're helping Haiti. And I think a lot of people don't realize what happened in 2004, how the U.S. took over and created this thing called the core group, which basically they're the ones that named Henri as the prime minister. It's a core group of U.S., France, Canada, Brazil, the European Union, and the OAS that, that call themselves the core group that manage Haitian affairs, even though we're supposed to be independent and sovereign. So I don't think Kenyans knew what was going on. And actually when some of them did find out is that's when they challenged, challenged this and went to court, which is what which is what threw a wrench in the US's plans. The Kenyans did this because William Ruto is a stooge of the US. And not only that, Kenya is broke. They need this IMF loan, right? And people don't know as soon as it, the, the Kenya and Haiti had no bilateral relations. It's the U.S. that made the bilateral relations. So the U.S. brought Kenyan people over and like, we're going to take you to Haiti so you can go there and meet meet folks. So, they, so as soon as Kenyan said they would take on this mercenary mission, Secretary, what is it? Sec Lloyd Austin went to Kenya and signed a five-year defense agreement well, to, with Kenya and promised Kenya $200 million to lead this mission. And so this is what's happening. Kenya's broke. The people don't really know you know, the history of Haiti, what's going on. And 
it's not, their leaders are different from them. And so what happened to the U.S. is that the Kenyan court stopped it after people protested, Kenyan citizens. And the U.S. did not expect that. They did not expect this, 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 this kind of, um, you know, stop in the road. So then they flew Ayo Ali, and the Kenyan court said they needed a clear bilateral agreement between the two heads of state, which was already illegal because Ali is not a head of state. According to the Constitution, prime ministers can't sign these kinds of agreements. We don't have a president. But the U.S. flew Ali to Kenya to sign this to, 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 to deal with the Kenyan courts. And that's when you know, the, the armed groups took over. And I don't think they anticipated that the armed groups would take over that fast. Oh my gosh. You said that Lula was involved. That makes me so... That oh, you should look up Brazil's leading uh, of the minister, the peacekeeping mission in Haiti, and the deaths and cholera and everything that 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 Brazil's mission did. And this is what caused a lot of... Um, among the leftists in Brazil, they were very upset that Lula did this. And Lula now is also part of the discussions trying to <laughs> push on us an unelect another unelected set of people. Oh, that makes me so angry, Jamina, because I just, you know, I've given him a lot of credit, like on the show. I did not know that he was involved uh, in this. 13-year occupation under Lula's military and those same military guys then went and turned on him because a lot of them made their careers on on haiti right haiti was brazil's training ground for military a lot of them went back became major military officials high positions and were then in the bolsonaro uh, government that actually ousted lula let me and now hear lula's playing the same role again this time this is so, oh my God, this is so disappointing because I, I just, of all people, you would think that he would know better. He knows how the U.S. operates. Like he's criticized the West. He's, he's criticized uh, Israel and rightfully so. Like, right, but, just, yeah, but think about, about this. The day after he made that speech about Israel committing genocide, Anthony Blinken flew into Brazil and there are pictures of them smiling because they, Anthony Blinken was talking about him leading this charge for Haiti. So... <sighs> So to me, you know, I always say the leftism of the Americas just crumbles at the door of Haitian sovereignty because no one stands up for Haiti. And these so-called leftist, um, leftist governments really, I mean, the only people that have said something against military intervention have been Venezuela and Cuba. Do you think that Haiti would be, or Haiti would benefit from being a part of BRICS? Or does Haiti want to be a part of BRICS? Well, this is this is a case. Okay, so Haiti is the entry point. The U.S. has this thing called the Global Fragilities Act that just that was passed under Trump and then um, consecrated under Biden and um, and Harris. The point of this is to, like it's a rewriting of the Monroe Doctrine, where the U.S. pretends itself, you know, basically says what they're going to do is use the regional partners to carry out. Um, to get buy-in whenever it has to do a military mission. So it's a combination of the State Department, the Department of Defense, and USAID, right? So this is the new thing where you use other partners to do that. One of the things is they want to militarize the region. And Haiti is, and they list Haiti. There are like five countries they start with. Haiti, Libya are the first two, <laughs> by the way, right? In terms of establishing their, you know, their new military, whatever, aid, military, um, defense, you know, a defense strategy, right? The thing about Haiti, Haiti is also, since, you know, Haiti was under a dictatorship, the Haiti is the other, the only, one of the few countries that still recognize Taiwan. And, and so part of the thing, part of the, you know, people, some people speculate that, for example, the last president was assassinated because he was thinking about reaching out to Russia, right? Or reaching out to China. There were deals, you know, wanting, you know, infrastructure deals that people wanted to do with China. Haiti's not allowed to do any of that, right? And so the US does not want to lose Haiti, right? In, in that lose Haiti, in that sense. So all of this has nothing to do with Haitian people. All of it has to do with having the Western press create a frenzy so that everybody can agree to say, oh my God, these people are eating each other. These black people are going around killing each other. The country's in flames. We need to do something right now. We need to send a military force right now to save these people. That's what the media is set up for, right? Because the truth is, Jamaica has an amazing, terrible gang problem. They've been under a state of emergency for most of last year. Look at the Mexican cartels. They're more armed than the US police. 
Look at Ecuador. They had a huge gang violence. Why is Haiti is the only place where there's so-called gang violence? That's baby everybody saying we need an armed foreign military intervention for an internal, you know, group problem that's only in the capital. That people should think about how absurd that is. I even remember, I believe it was last year when I covered this, uh, Sri Lankans actually rose up against their prime minister. Actually, there were thousands of them. They ran into his estate, kicked him out of his house. He ran away from the people and got on a plane. And like, I noticed that a lot of mainstream media did not cover that. Like I found it on Al Jazeera. I found it on uh, one, mainly European outlets, but I didn't find that really on mainstream media like MSNBC or CNN is really interesting. Uh, but just think about all the attention that they're giving to the so-called gangs or whatever in Haiti versus how silent they were about what happened in Sri Lanka. And they actually kicked the prime minister out of the country. Right. right. No, it is. So you have to always be careful when you, when it comes to Haiti, we always joke that you should see what plans the U S has for Haiti and when media coverage on Haiti begins, because you don't hear anything about Haiti. Right. I mean, look, the assassination has been happening. The assassination happened almost three years ago. Right. Why? You know, and, and, and so every time in the U.S. has been wanting uh, an armed foreign invasion of Haiti for two years to up to uphold this puppet, Arya only that it put in place. So the first call for a foreign invasion was to stop the protest. What's and then Arya only you say we we're being these gangs are taking over and so on and so forth. But it was like main, you know, it was like for poor people protesting and the poor people have been have bore the brunt of all of this, of the, the violence, because. You know these are tight these are tightly packed neighborhoods right and i won't call them ghettos or slums because i think that's so terrible that that language they're poor impoverished neighborhoods and that's what people are and a lot of these armed groups whenever the government is upset that that these are that's what the resistance is they always go in and shoot into these neighborhoods and kill a bunch of people so do these young armed our groups and so this has been happening these people this has been happening for two three years why is it now a big problem because the U.S. is ready to do what it needs to do to 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 take over Haiti. Because what's what is it doing now? Is it's it's meeting in Jamaica with 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 the stooges of Caricom, the Caribbean countries, and the Western powers to create a presidential council where Haitians <laughs> don't have a say. So they met in Jamaica, where it was Haiti, France. Can you ask yourself why France is in our business all the way over here? So you have you have the U.S., France, Canada, Mexico, and Brazil meeting to to come up with a solution for Haitians, right? The so-called political Haitian Haitianless solution. So what do they do? They meet three hours without any Haitians in the room to come up with a plan, and then they invite the hand-picked Haitians that they want. They invite they pick who they want, and then they tell them the only way for you to be part of this discussion is for you to agree that the first step is a foreign intervention into Haiti. <sighs> and so that itself is a non-starter. And so for those people who agree to those terms, everyone's looking and they're like, oh, okay, so you agree to the terms that the first thing you need is a foreign intervention. So you're allowing the U.S. to determine that. Mind you, the only thing that they suggest for Haitians is violence. You know, after the earthquake, the first thing the Haiti built, I mean, the U.S. built was prisons, right? They didn't build hospitals. They didn't build schools. They're not suggesting anything else but a foreign armed intervention. And I also want to point out that people are saying it's a U.N.-led or U.N. It's not. It's, it's in, if you read the U.N. resolution, it's an explicit non-U.N. resolution, which means, which means that there's no accountability. Because even under the UN, when we had UN occupation under these military soldiers that, you know, there's like, I think 500 and something cases of like paternity suits against the rapes of these soldiers and UN soldiers of Haitian women and children. There's the cholera that killed 30,000 Haitians and sick in the million that the UN soldiers brought. So, but at least it was a veneer of legality, right? Even the UN had immuni um, um, immunity. So now you're bringing Kenyans that are not under the UN purview. The UN did not want that because they said it would require too much force because they're basically going to have to go in there and shoot up the neighborhoods. These Kenyans don't speak French or Creole. So how are you going to de-escalate, right? You go in there, you just go and shoot people. So this is a mission to go in and kill people. And I think they're expecting the mission to fail so that they can come in and say, 
you've killed these Kenyans. We have to come in and, 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 and save you. I want to go back to the earthquake in Haiti uh, because I have a lot of beef with the Red Cross uh, because of their activity. Uh, they raised all this money, millions and millions of dollars. And then I was reading articles that said they built like a Six couple houses. of houses. Yeah. What happened to all that money? And then I want to connect that to the situation in reference to immigration in this country, because I also remember this is under Biden's presidency. Uh, there were Haitian migrants that were trying to come across the border. And I think a lot of us remember seeing those pictures of the, the Rangers that were on the horses and they were trying to whip them, whatever they were using. They were trying to basically hit uh, the Haitian migrants and the Biden administration had to quickly address that. Right. So it's just listen to everything that Jamima just said. And this is what I want people to understand when we talk about, you know, why are people coming here or why are so many people coming here? You have to think about the foreign, the interventions in these countries that our government is doing. If somebody came into your country or if someone came to the United States and they destroyed our country and we didn't have hardly anything left, we had still have resources, but they were taking the resources. So we didn't have anything left. What would you do? You would try to leave. So I want to make that connection there with I want to hear a little bit more about the Red Cross, like after the earthquake and uh, the migration uh, movement that's happening as well. Right. The You know, as far as I'm concerned, humanitarian aid is a jobs program for the Western countries. You know, I was I was in I was in Haiti after the earthquake. Um, I'd gone back and forth and I was visiting a friend um, and and I, I have a piece written about this because you there it was devastation and communities were coming together people were sleeping you know under tents because they're afraid to go under their buildings because you know there were still aftershocks and so on and so forth so he's like let me show you something so he drives me all the way to you know about 45 minutes from the capital city in this to this resort where it used to be a former club club med and it was all the humanitarian workers i walked in there and it was just like food they're doing step aerobics. There's the beach. There's the pool. There's like, and then, you know, I met this young guy who's like from Australia and he's just like, yeah, well, you know, we have to come here to help. And so for me, you know, most of the money went into these kinds of things, the money for humanitarian aid. And they will tell you this, the most of the money that was the $13 billion raised for Haiti was spent in the Washington area with these contractors all these people who made money off of Haiti. The other thing is the U.S. has a policy since 2000 of not giving aid money to actual Haitian governments. They give them to the NGOs who then distribute them, which actually gives the pot, the NGOs, the inter, and not local NGOs, the international NGOs that have power, more power than the state, right, than the, gov than the Haitian government. So most of the money went to these NGOs. Most of the contracts went to the elite and their buddies, Bill Clinton's buddies in Haiti, right? Building, you know, the one thing they built was a factory for cheap labor in the North and a, the Marriott Hotel, all that, it, Marriott Hotel in Port Prince, all that was aid money, right? So the aid money was to go and up to maintain the lifestyle of all these humanity, so-called humanitarian workers who have to make sure that they create a horrible picture of Haiti so that they can keep getting their funding. So that that's what happened. The other thing is, I want to talk briefly about migration because it's important. I think you're absolutely right. Because the reason you had Haitian migrants, because I used to live in Southern California in, in, in LA, and I would go and I used to work with migrants at the border, um, US-Mexico border. These migrants, you know where they're coming from? They're coming from Brazil. You know why they're, going, they're in Brazil? They're in Brazil because Brazil was occupying Haiti from 2004 to 2017, because hey, Brazil was leading the military um, intervention, and Brazil allowed, opened up, gave some visas, and, and they needed cheap workers because they had the World Cup and the Olympics, right? This is so. So we think about this. So they, they, you know, these Haitians went to Brazil because look, they would have not ne never thought about going to Brazil if the Brazilians were not there in the country. They go in Brazil. Brazil has an economic downturn, and they all leave between the racism in Brazil and the economic downturn. A lot of people trek seven countries north to get to the u.s mexico border so by 2016 you have the beginning of the end of the waves of the border the reason the numbers are so high at the borders the other thing people forget and this is obama and trump the remain in mexico policy look international law says anyone can go up to any 
um, border and ask for asylum and you, and you would be heard. So what Obama basically started doing was slowing down the process along with the collusion of the Mexican government. So a lot of people basically, they started giving them schedules when they can go up to the border and ask for asylum, which made the population in Mexico swell. So people sometimes would wait two, three years before they had an appointment at the border to ask for asylum, which, so now, you know, if you want the best Haitian food in Western, the in Northwest, you go to Mexico, you go to Tijuana because all these Haitians are stuck there. So people have been there for years right? And then you had Trump, the Title 42 after COVID, which basically used this old law to say, because of disease, we won't let people in. So you say there's a there's a swell of migration. It's, it's not to say that there are not more people coming, but it's like a lot of people were stuck there already from years of, of policies. But let me tell you the difference, though. The past two years, the U.S. has let in almost 300,000 Ukrainians, no one talks about that kind of migration, right? And I remember the Ukrainians would come in and walk through the border and then the churches would be waiting for them on the other side because nobody was stopping them. I'm in Canada right now. Canada, in the past year, almost a million Ukrainians have been allowed in. So if we're going to talk about migration, we should talk about all the migrants because Ukrainians are getting um, preferential treatment, but not the Palestinians. Right? right. So we have to talk about the migration problem. It has to do with a lot more than just, um, you know, the border being. So, so it's like the kinds of migrants that people in these countries don't want. But also not realizing that people also don't realize that it is the reality that it is U.S. imperialism and it's U.S. destabilization of these countries that is, that is forcing people out looking for a, a, a way to make a living because their lives are so terrible. Nobody wants to be a migrant. Nobody wants nope. to take their baby and put on a boat or tra travel through the, the, you know, the, the rainforest of Colombia with a child. Nobody wants to do that. It's because they have to. They're, they're desperate. Whenever the person decides to leave, they are desperate. But they're desperate because the U.S. has destabilized their country and made it almost unlivable. Well said there, uh, Jamima. One more question. I know I said that was last one. Just one more really quick about the DR. Uh, last year, I covered a story that showed the Dominican Republic was actually trying to uh, remove Haitians from the DR, including those that were actually born in the Dominican Republic. Uh, there was a woman uh, that was on Al Jazeera. She said that she had her children in the DR. So they had been there for at least six, seven years. And all of a sudden, they were trying to say the Haitians had to to leave. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Do you think it is because of, of racism? I've heard about racism between the DR and Haiti, or do you think it's because uh, the Dominican Republic was basically trying to claim uh, that, you know, the the migrant situation or the, how you say it, the, the immigration that came into the Dominican Republic, they were trying to copy Europe, uh, so to speak, some of the European countries and say, no, 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 we don't want we don't want that. We want the country just for us. What do you think that is the real cause of that? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, I want to talk about that quickly, but I also want to just remind people that Biden has deported more Haitian people in the past three years of his presidency than, than Donald Trump. Um, even they were deporting people up until this crisis in February 20th. So even now they're catching people. They're even thinking about opening up Guantanamo Bay to put Haitian migrants fleeing um, the violence, and people don't realize this, Guantanamo Bay was used for after 9-11, right, um, as this, you know, prison site, but it was used on Haitians in the 90s first. Haitians were the first people. We're always the experiment, right? We're the, you know, we're the laboratory, and so they're trying to do that. So Biden has, even through all this crisis, there's always a plane load. The only reason there's not a plane load of Haitians going back is because the Port-au-Prince airport is closed, but the Northern airport is open. And by the way, you know, Haiti's at war, but there's commercial flights going in in the Northern airport. So <laughs> there's that. But the history of Dominican Republic and Haiti is a long one. Um, and it goes back to slavery and it goes back to just a, a virulent anti-Black racism, anti-Haitian racism in the Dominican Republic. In fact, this is not the first time the Dominican Republic has denationalizations. You know, there's a, the, the, the 1937 massacre of Haitians is a, is, is a stain on the country's history. This was under Trujillo, this dictator in the Dominican Republic. And basically um, they had Haitians who've been living there 
and you know, in doing the dirty jobs that Dominicans want to do in the sugarcane fields, they've been there a long time. They were they were hacked to death and thrown into this river. The river's not called Massacre River. They killed thirty thousand Haitians, right, with machetes. This is the history of the Dominican Republic. And in two thousand thirteen, they passed a law that denationalized um, Dominicans of Haitian descent going back eight generations, which means like a, almost a quarter of a million people. That's what they did. And the, the funny thing is the Dominican, um, uh, uh, the Dominican economy does not work without Haitians. They need the Haitian cheap labor, which has been there over, but they also need the Haitian markets. They dump their goods on Haitian markets all the time. And so if you shut down the trade, they're, they're suffering. And I also have not to say that not to, uh, I think it's the Dominican, Dominican elite who've always hated Haiti um, from the very beginning. But what they're doing now is basically their neoliberal policies have left the Dominican Republic in terrible economic straits, in dire straits. So what do they do? They do what everybody else does. You you turn and you basically go to your resident uh, people that you can pick on. And so they're using the immigration problem to to not deal with their failed their economic and, and their failed economic policies that is making people suffer. And so then they turn around and they blame that on these people who've been there for generations. Mm. Jamima Pierre, thank you so much. Um, I would love to see you on everyone's show. I've, I've seen a lot of people come on and, and talk about Haiti, uh, but you really know your stuff. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for having me, Sabrina. Good to see you.